Today, on the Woven Energy Podcast. It's not the case that shamanism itself developed late in Japan. Shamanism was in Japan as soon as people were in Japan, because the first people who arrived in Japan were shamanists. Shamanism, people start to revert to shamanism when instability is introduced into society, and when society starts fragmenting. And that makes perfect sense, because shamanism is very, very good at running small groups of people. One of the other issues with Japan is, Japan is, is probably one of the the world's worst cases of the rewriting of history. Even worse than China went along the lines of good people do good things, bad people do bad things, but it takes religion to make good people do bad things. So they started changing the religion. And when you're very well educated and very broadly educated, and you view religion in an exoteric way, it's very, very easy to start pulling holes in it. You know, it can't possibly be true. You know, it's just nonsense. But the biggest place where this stuff survives today in Japan is in the various branches of the Shin you kill the new religions. But even there, you have to look at it with an educated eye. You have to investigate, and as I've done. So they started clamping down on it, and ironically, this gave rise to a wave of shamans, uh, some of them great shamans that arose in Japan at around this same time. If you look at what happened with these shamanistic groups in Japan, it took 20 years maximum for them to become <laughs> ridiculously exoteric from a very, very shamanistic style. Hey guys, welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast with me, Joseph Sykora and Damon Smith, bringing you, as always, a complete resource on shamanism from the ground up. Now, the last few episodes have been focused on practical techniques from stage two, the AMSCA, and as always, these techniques are only useful and mean anything when you build them on stage one, Chilicity. You can't listen to these episodes enough, and that's episodes seven, eight, and nine, and also our little side episode between episodes 18 and 19. These cover Chilicity in quite a bit of depth, and I'm sure there will be more to come. But this week, Damon had the idea of doing an episode on an introduction to Japanese shamanism as the next AMSCA technique he wants to teach comes from Japan. Uh, Now, it's a fundamental message of this podcast that besides the cultural aspects, the heart of shamanism is the same thing wherever you find it. And this is uh, something which becomes very apparent as soon as you start actually practicing it for real and not either think you're practicing it or approaching it academically. It's what separates shamanism from religion and in many ways proves to us uh, who practice it that man is not our teacher, the natural world is. However, this is not to say that there isn't anything to explore by looking at shamanism from different areas of the world as it broadens our perspective and it widens our palate. So Japanese shamanism, uh, not something many people would be familiar with, uh, myself included. So I'm very much the student in this episode and I'm going to hand you all over to Damon. Uh, Damon, there is so much to explore here, but do you want to start with a general introduction to Japanese shamanism and, and why you want to bring it up? Sure. So, well, I guess the the simple reason we want to bring it up is we want to do a a Japanese style AMSCA technique. (laughs) Mm. um, But, you know, it's it's an interesting subject. Um, Japanese, the development of Japanese shamanism kind of parallels the development of shamanism that we talked about in China, um, except that obviously it it happened at a later date. Um, Or rather, the development of... um, the development of the forms of shamanism that exist in Japan today um, started at a later date than the forms of shamanism that exist in China uh, today. Mm. Um, they, they, it was really starting only about 300 BC um, that, 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 the, that the transition from from old hunter-gatherer style shamanism, which was the same everywhere, Mm. Uh, virtually the same everywhere, to the the sort of embedded forms of shamanism uh, that we see today got started in Japan, um, which is obviously much later than than the similar thing happened in in China. So what I'm saying is it's not the case that shamanism itself developed late in Japan. Shamanism was in Japan as soon as people were in Japan because the first people who arrived in Japan were shamanists. And, but it was that old school shamanism that's, you know, virtually identical Hunter gatherer shamanism that's virtually identical, um, yeah. with a few, shall we say, trivial, superficial variations uh, the world over and, and throughout all time. 
Um, but the ways in which shamanism survived in Japan, that's probably the best way to put it, uh, started developing at a later time because the Japanese people stayed shamanistic longer. Um, the, the rise of agriculture, um, serious agriculture in Japan happened during a, um, uh, a, a period of time when, um, I guess you could say that ag- agricultural wealth and agricultural technology got got serious enough that they could propel um, they could propel certain individuals into positions of power and mm-hmm. start the exoteric uh, the exoteric revolution, if you like. Um, and obviously, Japan had less agricultural mm-hmm. land available than than the north of China, for instance. What kind of period are we talking here? With, so, like well, the, 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 period, the period has a name. The period has a name. It's called the Yayoi period in Japan. And it, it extends from 300 BC through to, you would you would say, um, depending on how you count it, uh, 250 AD through to 300 AD, that, that sort of time period. So six, 600, 600 years. 600 years either side of zero mm. BC, yeah, or zero AD, yeah. Um, and... This this was a, a heavy transitional period. There are there are various arguments among archaeologists of whether the Yayoi people were actually the self same people as the the earlier Jomon culture, which are much more shamanistic culture. Um, that that ran from sort of fourteen thousand BC through to one thousand BC, mm. um, or whether the Yayoi was just a, a, a development of earlier cultures. Um, my my own guess on these things is that. Um, is that there's a combination of both things going on. You have people coming in from outside. I mean, very clearly, despite, you know, one, one of the other issues with Japan is Japan is is probably one of the world's worst cases of the rewriting of history, um, even, even worse than China. Um, mm. And, you know, that that's continued right into modern times. I mean, the the very few things have been more influential on the rewriting of history um whether that's rewriting it into a more correct or less correct form is is irrelevant really than the the japanese loss in the second world war um so we're talking about very modern times history being rewritten for political purposes um and you know the also the lead up to the second world war when uh you know for originally japan um, was brought out of isolation uh, by the Americans um, in 1853. A guy called Matthew Perry uh, basically mil- humiliated them militarily. But basically, Japan was still a, a, like an old school feudal culture, you know, and they had swords and they had the odd flintlock <laughs> musket, <laughs> and they, you know, and he basically sailed um, sailed modern warships into what is now Tokyo. It was called Edo in those days, Harper, and, and just humiliated the military government. Yeah. Uh, which which uh, about a decade and a bit later actually fell as a result of this and other things. Um, so so when you look at Japanese history, you you have a lot of hard work to do to see what goes on because even today the influence of the loss in the Second World War is very very strong on historians, um, and. And you don't really, you know, you have to fight to get a clear picture, any kind of a clear picture of, of what actually went on in Japan. But um, and and part of the reason that this is particularly um, uh, strong in the domain of shamanism and the origins of shamanism is, of course, uh, what's known as state Shinto. Um, Shinto was the religion that developed out of, or the, the, shall we say, the group of religions that developed out of traditional uh, Japanese shamanism. Um, and if you you can think of uh, Shinto before sort of probably uh, the turn of the nineteenth century, that'd be around eighteen hundred. You can think of Shinto as a group of local um semi shamanistic um uh religions that have been uh exotericized to an extent but which still have very very significant strong uh shamanistic um you don't components. need to dig that far beneath the surface 
Yeah, well, certainly in 1800, you wouldn't have had to. Mm. Um, but what happened subsequently is that Japan, because of the humiliation of the uh, and the, the eventual fall of the, you know, Japan had a military government for a long time. Uh, because of the fall of the, the military government uh, and the restoration of the emperor to power in 1868, uh, you gotta you got to think that we, you talk about putting the emperor back on the throne. Um, Japan hadn't had an emperor on the phone since 1185. So this is, you know, this is a very, very, uh, very, very, um, big move to put the emperor back on the throne after all that time, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it had emperors, but they weren't in any kind of power. Um, they were, the, the Japan was run by a bunch of what we would call generalissimos. Um, but anyway, so, so they put the emperor back on the throne and then Japan immediately went the other way. It went from this insular country to this very, very Western leading culture. Um, and they imported a lot of expertise from the West, actually from, from the UK in particular. Um, they hired a lot of our military people, uh, naval people, army people. Um, and we helped them modernize their, we helped them modernize their military, get a modern navy, a modern army, modern air force. Yeah. Um, and we also trained them in something else that we were doing at that time, which we don't do anymore, but we were doing at that time. You got to think, you know, the, the late 1800s, we trained them in empire building. Um, uh, we, if you like, you can think of Britain as their teacher, uh, who they sort of looked up to and respected and, and that their, their respected teacher was doing empire building. So Japan thought, mm, maybe we should do empire building too. <laughs> uh, and the rest is history, right? You know, so, yeah. um, so, and it wasn't just Britain, you know, the other countries were doing empire building at the same time. So, so this was the start of all the trouble, really. And, and in, in order to galvanize, so, you know, when you build an empire, you, your, your forces have to do pretty unpleasant things. They have to go into the countries of other people and basically suppress, forcefully suppress those people and make them do your bidding in a very, very, you know, command and control kind of, uh, model. Um, yeah. it's, it's sort of like taking that general idea of the Wang at the top of society, uh, having control of the agricultural surplus and then imposing their will down through layers of suboperatives. Um, you could take that on a global scale and then you get empire building like British Empire, the Japanese Empire. Um, and, um, empire by force rather than stealth, yeah absolutely so basically into... you, you have to you have to get your people to do some pretty unpleasant stuff and it's quite hard to persuade people because people tend to be naturally good you know they, they tend to be naturally quite nice people on the whole um and how do you get nice people to do bad things well um i forget who it was that said this um i think it might have been richard Dawkins. so it might have been richard Dawkins quoting somebody else but it was it went along the lines of good people do good things bad people do bad things but it takes religion to make good people do bad things mm. so they started changing the religion um start engineering their religion to support the the military um and uh, western uh democratic governmental model um you could call it a, a democratic uh military complex something of that nature uh they had exactly the same kind of democracy that we have um it's a parliamentary democracy based based on the british model um and you know the emperor is at the head um in in of, of that and you know the emperor was in some ways a figurehead in some ways very powerful which very very closely paralleled the the monarch of britain at the same time um obviously that'd be victoria um mm. and um so what happened was they, they, they put this great, so they needed to unify. They needed to unify the country. And what Shinto was not a great, the original Shinto was not a great unifier. It was little local groups doing their semi-shamanistic things in different ways and different times and different places all over the country. That wasn't good enough. So they started to come up with, if you like, a Western religious style, um, uh, I don't know what you would call it, really, um, a, a doctrine or um, dogma, a set of dogmas. Because uh, what they saw is that, you know, the people that were learning from, which for us, and, us and other countries, successful countries, in the as successful as they saw it in the West, um, we had these things we call religions of a book. And they, they yeah. tend to galvanize us. So Christianity, Islam, uh, Judaism all, all have a book or scrolls or something that they that they hold to be the, the truth of their religion. 
or to contain the truth or truths related to their religions. And, and this sort of cent- forms a central focus. This doctrine or dogma forms a central focus. Something to can... refer to, something solid that they can refer exactly. to. Exactly. So, but Shinto didn't have anything like this. You know, Shinto is not a, not a, Shinto grew out. It's just the natural extension of shamanism developing within an increasingly exoteric society, but it, it didn't have any equivalent of that. So, so they went back to actually some early historical records. Um, two things. One, one was called the Kojiki, and and the other one's called the Nihon Shoki. And these these two books are really sort of you know those sort of King Arthur and his his knights type of thing. That that time period when hist- mythology is crossing over into history, and they're sort of like mythical history books. Yeah. And they tried to make a religion out of this, and they called it State Shinto. Um, and it had very, very little in common with Shinto Shinto, if you like. Um, so State Shinto. Oh, State right. Shinto, yeah. <laughs> sounds yeah. dodgy, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds dodgy as hell, doesn't it? You know. And um and so they used this new religion to unify and galvanize the country. Um and but at at the same time there was a lot of social um upheaval going on inside Japan. Um, and so ironically, because they tried to, they tried to clamp down, um, actually they, for, for a period of time, they, they had the opposite effect to on some certain sections of society. There was sort of a, a knee jerk. So if, if you like, they come in and said, our religion's not exoteric enough. So they started clamping down on it. And ironically, this gave rise to a wave of shamans, uh, some of them great shamans that arose in Japan at around this same time, who who sort of found... It forced it, them out. It forced them... Gathered... Well, I don't know if it forced them to actually appear in the first place, but it, there was certainly an appetite for going countercurrent at that time. You know, yeah. so we're talking about the late the late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, yeah. By the time you get round to the sort of nineteen you get round to the sort of nineteen thirties, then the the government's state chinto had had got control of education. Um and so that the these things were suppressed pretty brutally eventually. Um, but for a time period, they kind of flourished. And, and it's often an overlooked time period. And, and you have some of the most famous shamans in Japanese history uh, during this time period. Uh, Shimoyama Osuke, um, Nakayama Miki, Onishi Ajiro, Bunjiro Kowate. Uh, a bunch of these people flourished during this time period. And, and they they were effectively, I guess they were what people might describe as great shamans. Uh, there were people who didn't just go into the shamanistic state every now and again, but kind of lived and breathed in it, didn't, didn't, rarely left it, I think is probably the best way to, to put mm. it. And each one of these people gathered a following. Um, Shimoyama Osuke was uh, associated with a mountain called Mount Antake in, in Japan. And the, the, the following of people that, that gathered around him were, were called Ontakekyo, um, after the mountain. And, you know, we've, we've talked about Maiza before, haven't we? On, I think yeah. on the podcast, you know, that they are big on that kind of thing. Um, it, it's very much, a, uh, I don't know if we, did, did we discuss the decision, but the, this, the distinction between Kami Roshi and Kami Gakari on this podcast. I can't remember if we did that or not. But just briefly... We might have that, done in the Miasma episode when you were yeah. talking about Maiza. Yeah, they're, they're two different ways of looking at experiencing the shamanistic state. And they're, and they're definitely post-analysis. They have nothing to do with when you're in the shamanistic state. But but there can be a sense that the, the spirit of nature is being drawn actively drawn down inside you through the technique. And that would be called Kami Aroshi. Um, but there's also a sense where you become, I think we talked about like a tea bag in the ocean, where yeah. the spirit of nature just permeates you through its own through its own energy and through its own devices. And that would be Kami Gakari. And and these people uh, a lot of these people were very much of the latter um, in terms of what they were famous for, the shamanism that they were famous for, they were very much of the latter variety, um, and and they they developed significant followings during this time period, which during the sort of nineteen thirties, late nineteen twenties, early nineteen thirties uh, to mid nineteen thirties, got heavily suppressed, but they weren't stamped out entirely. Um, so there were, then there was a further wave of, of the expansion of these things. Once the Japanese lost the Second World War, there was immediately a further wave of expansion. The state Shinto had obviously been, you know, 
overthrown. It would have gone, mm. um, uh, thanks to MacArthur and others. Um, but again, talking about just the to explore that a second. I'm, I'm, I've lost yeah. you there. Oh, so sorry. The the American occupying forces or the Western occupying forces in Japan after the Second World oh, War. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. They they overthrew a lot of these institutions that the Japanese had been told were ancient, like the state Shinto. Um. Yeah. Really ancient. Less than less than fifty years old. That's really ancient. That is. You know. <laughs> um. But um. It depend on your way you look at it. You know. Yeah. Um. But the you know there had been so you had this amazing period of re, repeat repetitive rewriting of history. We had the rewriting of history with the fall, after following the fall of the, the military governments in Japan. It might be worth saying a word or two about that um, in a moment. Mm. The We had the rewriting of history in order to support the rise of the Western-leaning militaristic um, empire-building government in Japan. Then we had the Second World War and we had the uh, the rewriting of history in order to get rid of these things that, that the the government, Japanese government have put in in order to brainwash the people into supporting the war effort, um, and then we had the rewriting of history again in order for the Japanese to justify to themselves the the, the their meaning in a new world where they'd lost this this war and, and a lot of the values that they valued, like the, the undefeatability of the Japanese people. You know, going back to the Mongol invasions and the the kamikaze. You know the the kamikaze, sorry, being the divine wind that was supposed to come along during the Mongol invasions. Actually, it, it, its significance was much lower than is usually billed. Um, so that the modern Japanese have to come to terms with this, uh, and so a rewriting a history again, uh, just oh. just in order to make that comfortable. And I, I predict there is a further rewriting of history that's going to go on in future, when a Japanese generation, you know, become the historians of the future who have no particular connection to the events of World War II within themselves. Um, and then there will be a rewriting again at that point. You think a rewriting to try and write it back to it more it, a more accurate depiction of what the history well, was? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that ever possible? That's a question, you know, is that ever possible? What, what my view on this, you know, I, I've done a bit of history in my time. My view on this is that it rather than trying to figure out what really went on, you want a broad picture. You want to get everybody's view, all the different interpretations of what went on. And then through that, you know, kind of shamanistically, if you like, you can get some sort of feeling for what went on, some kind of flavor of what went on. Um, being opinionated about stuff is not very, not very helpful, you know, yeah. in general. Sometimes heuristics, rules of thumb can be useful in certain contexts, especially when there's no time to think. Um, but really, a, a good broad view, and, and Japanese history is very, very complicated. Um, but you do need to understand the, the the motivations behind the rewritings. Another motivation in modern Japanese society is that there's there's a rebellion against. Uh, uh, so these these um, they call them the Shinshu Kyo, the new religions. Um, that basically, rel new religions that grew up in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, and then just again they had a, another burst after the end of World War Two. Uh, these new religions, they um, they were all founded, most of them, vast majority of them were founded by shamans um, or founded by somebody who was close to a shaman, more like, uh, for instance, the Nakayama Miki, the shamaness, didn't actually found Tenri no Kosha. Uh, Nakayama Miki's son, Shuji, founded Tenri no Kosha. Um, Nakayama Miki herself, the shamaness herself, actually frowned on that activity and wasn't very impressed. Frankly, but um, so the um, why was that? Uh, because, well, one, the, there's a number of reasons. You know, shamans tend not to be into these hierarchical kind of things. And when you create mm -hmm. a group, a religious group, you need somebody at the top of that. Well, people seem to think you do. And then under that, there'll be, I don't know, if you want to think about it, you've got your cardinals and your deacons and your, your bishops and your archbishops, you know, these different kind of ranks. Yeah. And, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with what Mickey and others were trying to teach, which was shamanism. Um, but people are so have this stuff so deeply ingrained within them that they feel a need to do that kind of thing. And her very own son, Shuji, felt the need to do this, and, and she thought it was a bit daft. Another reason that he... So obviously when these groups started to become bigger, um, the, the government started cracking down on them pretty heavily. There was a lot of persecution, um, all of them, um, pretty much all of them. And... 
one of the, the motivations for Shuji to found that Tenri no Kusha was um, uh, to get protection from, uh, the, at that time, the most powerful religious body in Japan, which was known as Yoshida Shinto. Um, we can maybe go into what, <clears throat> why Yoshida Shinto is very, uh, very important. Um, uh, because if, if you like, Yoshida Shinto was an attempt to get back to the more shamanistic origins of Shinto. Um, f- because at a much earlier date, certainly during the late, um, mid to late imperial period, this is before the military governments arose, uh, Buddhism came into Japan and started exotericizing Shinto. There was a wave of exotericism. Sorry. Yeah, there was a wave of exotericism at that point. Um, so it's during the Nara Hera Heian periods, um, and a bit earlier. Um, so, so effectively, the Yoshida Shinto uh, was was created by a guy called Yoshida Kantomo. Well, it wasn't created by him. Um, okay, let's wind all the way back. Wind all the way back. We have to go back a long way. So these early early shamans in Japan, just like anywhere else, as soon as the power structures started to appear in Japan, so this would be like the Aoi period, or maybe a little bit earlier into the Jomon period. Which is when? Um, uh, so Let's just put a date on this. 300 BC ish, yeah? yeah. Okay. So these these power structures. Um, Can I just ask? Until that 300 BC, there would be what you would call a bit more leaning towards uh, hunter gatherer shamanism. Yeah, yeah, much closer anyway, much yeah. closer. Yeah. So from that point onwards, um, you got the progressive development of exotericism, and the exotericism. Um, uh, or as like it always does, it immediately seeks to suppress shamanism. Um, because, you know, shamans are, their allegiance is to nature. It's not to individual human beings. Uh, and their allegiance is also to the good of the group as a whole. That was always their role, not to the good of particular individuals within the group. So, so they had to go underground. And one of the, uh, one of the, um, ways in which they went underground was to take on jobs. That were that were good covers for their shamanistic activities. So that is, you take on a work role within society that when you practice shamanism, it doesn't make your your work role doesn't make that look that unusual. And and one group of shamans um, became what are known as omyosha. Um, Omyosha are, are like court divinators. They're people who, are in the Western sense, you know, they're, oh, we, we talked about the dragon bones in China, didn't we? Yeah. And the, yeah, oracle bones and that type of stuff. So the, the, the Omyosha were doing this type of thing. Uh, they were divinators to the imperial court and they were, you know, telling the emperor things like, oh, we'll probably have a good harvest next year, all that kind of stuff. So slightly, so, and, and you know, we've talked about this. Some of them could be doing that genuinely shamanistically and they might have been actually right. And others may have been doing it just as a kind of, you know, a uh, way of making a living um, and didn't care whether they were right or wrong. Um, but but basically, the, the, there became a group of Omyosha who were called divinators to the to the imperial family, and and they they sort of consolidated into a, a what you would call a secret family um, known as the Urabe. Um, Ura, it, the, the word it, it can have many different interpretations, but here's one that was taught to me: um, if you flip a coin um, and you're allowed to land on the table, say. The, the side that's uppermost, that's, that's known as omote. That's the obvious or visible side. And, but the side that's underneath, um, the, 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 if you like, if, it, if it's heads upwards, then the tail side of the coin, that would be ura, the, the hidden side, the side you can't see. And be can mean clan or family. So if you think of that, ura, the hidden family, uh, rabe, the hidden family, uh, is what they were originally called. And these people became very, very useful to the emperors and, and later to the shoguns when the, when the military governments, um, they, they were quite flexible. They were still very, very shamanistic pe- people. And if, if, as, if as, um, either an emperor or a shogun, you wanted something done with a certain level of subterfuge or something done in a fairly sophisticated way, rather than, for instance, using main battlefield troops, you might want something done in a more, um, in a more subtle, way. subtle way. They would often turn to these people to, the Orabe. Um, <clears throat> now the emperors was were 
quite pleased with these guys. Um, and they obviously did a good job because they lasted forever, the Arabi family. I mean, in some circumstances, they're kind of still going in Japan today. Yeah, so, you know, they lasted forever. Uh, but they're not as, nowhere near as powerful as they once were. Um, and and so what happened was that the, the divinators, um, they became so powerful that, that they had to, do a lot of their stuff in the open. And so the, one of the emperors gave them this name, Yoshida, um, as a kind of family name um, under which a banner under which they could they could pursue their their stuff more openly, things more, more political. Because they were doing stuff on such a big scale that they, it couldn't all be he, secret and behind doors because we're talking about eventually doing stuff on a national scale in Japan. Um uh, at one point, the Yoshida family controlled most of the shrines in Japan, and there are thousands and thousands of shrines in Japan, for instance. Um, you can't sort of cover that kind of thing up. So they used this word Yoshida rather than Arabe. And and they just grew increasingly powerful. And the transition in 1185 from imperial rule to military rule, it put a little stop to that for a while. So the... Um, Imperial rule came to an end, as I said, in 1185. And that was the start of the first military government. Probably everybody's heard of a shogun. Um, uh, Probably because of the famous book by James Clavell, you know, called Shogun, yeah? Uh, (laughs) And I think there's also a car called a shogun, isn't there? Uh, (laughs) Off-road or something, yeah? So... So Shogun was like a general SMO, and, and the very first one was a guy called um, Minamoto Yoritomo, uh, who who leveraged a bunch of guys who had been called the Conde, uh, the stalwart youths. They, they'd been guys who'd grown up in the countryside, but had become powerful militarily. And he used that to propel himself into a position of power within Japan um, and effectively usurped the... Um, position of the the head of state um and basically what he did is he he turned the emperor from a from a de facto ruler into a a puppet a puppet ruler um with and effectively became the real ruler himself Mm. um that was done under military force and that first kamakura period which ran from about 1185 through to 1333 that i think it's 1333 uh that's that was a, a military might type of thing. Um, and did they ever need it? Because that was time the Mongols showed up. You know, we, we said the Japanese are the only people who ever beat a main Mongol, a, a main battle force, Mongol army in the field. Um, and the, they did so twice, really, um, which is quite impressive um, when everybody else was losing to them left, right and centre, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, And so... So, unfortunately for the Mongols, that was the time period during which they they arrived. And what they ran into was a bunch of professional soldiers, you know, uh, which they hadn't really encountered anywhere else, except maybe the Mamluks from Egypt. Um, but but in general, in general, they hadn't really, they, you know, most of the soldiers in those days weren't full-time professionals. So, so anyway, um, uh, a guy called Hojo Tokimune was very uh, instrumental in that, uh, one of the world's least known and probably greatest generals. Um, and then towards, so during that period, uh, Japan was ruled with, if you like, a bit of an iron fist. Uh, the the Yoshida stroke, uh, Urabe was still there. They were still reasonably powerful, but they weren't really, really needed very much. But then towards the end of that period, a guy called Godaigo, uh, an emperor, a puppet emperor, uh, decided he didn't want to be a puppet emperor anymore. And he thought, hey, I'll be, I'll be the real emperor. And he got a bunch of people to take up arms against the Kamakura shogunate. Mm. Uh, and he, um, he almost succeeded. Um, and there was a, one of the Kamakura generals, a guy called, uh, Takuji. Um, he, um, he was fighting against Godaigo originally, but then, you know, like these guys do when exotericism comes along, it's like stab you in the back at exactly the wrong instant. He switched sides <laughs> and supported Godaigo. Um, but, you know, Godaigo should have known, shouldn't he? You know, somebody like that, you just turn around and stab somebody in the back. They're going to turn around and stab you in the back, which is exactly what he did a couple of years later, yeah. um, or even less than that. And he put, put himself on the throne as the, the first, uh, Ashkaga. Shogun. This is the second shogunate. So Japan had three great shogunates. There was the Kamakura, the Ashikaga, and the Tokugawa. Um, and then, but then during this period, 
Takuji and his his family, uh, the Ashikaga family, were nowhere near as powerful as the early um, uh, the early Kamakura shoguns had been. They, they couldn't rule Japan. There were, there were a bunch of regional warlords, they call them daimyo, great names, all over Japan, and they couldn't run Japan like that, you know, with an iron fist. They didn't have the military wherewithal to do that, so they had to turn to subterfuge. Well, fortunately from them, there was this bunch of guys known as the Yoshida who were really good at that kind of thing. So the Yoshida had another boost uh, during this time period and became very, very powerful during the the, um, the, um, the Ashikaga period. And towards the end of the Ashikaga period... Um, well, towards the, the, well, maybe the middle. Anyway, in the middle of the Ashikaga period, this guy called uh, Yoshida Kanatomo, who's the most famous person in the whole of Shinto, probably. Probably the most famous Shinto practitioner ever. You could call him a shaman, um, because what he tried to do was get rid of all the exotericism out of Shinto, and he wanted to create what he called Genpon uh, Sogen Yuitsu Shinto, uh, which just basically means Shinto of the original source, the original source being shamanism yeah. yeah and so he he brought back this idea that you get in contact um you get in contact with nature through what's already inside you you know this was the amsgar if you like was the core of his philosophy the idea that we start within us and we look at if you like this the the spirit that's within us the japanese call that kami that we, we, we gain a communion with that spirit that's within us, the spirit of nature. And through that, we start to extend out into the rest of that spirit, which permeates the entire universe. So, you know, very, very topical guy, because we're all here on Amska, and Yoshida Kanatoma made Amska. He made, it's not called Amska in Japanese. It's called Genpon. <laughs> so, <laughs> you to Shinto, yeah? But, uh, which doesn't even trip off the tongue as quickly as Amska does, yeah? But, but the, the, the fundamental part of his ideas were to, get back to shamanism, if you like, the Shinto of the original source, to get rid of all the Buddhist influence, get rid of all the exotericism. And yeah. and he did, of course, he didn't fully succeed, but did he ever have a good go at it? Just, and, just let's, let's just say, what, what time period was this again, roughly? So, well, Kanatomo so died... Ken Tomo died in 1511. Okay, um, I see. But he became very, very influential. Um, so, effectively, the, the, the Ashkaga people were very early... Ashkaga people were very, very um, powerful. You know, they were great names themselves. They were daimyo themselves. You could say that uh, Takeuchi was the this individually the strongest of several regional warlords in Japan, um, and and among those, he was you know probably just barely the strongest. Uh, but the thing is, if any two of them had ganged up together on him, he'd have been in trouble. Yeah. Mm. So so hence the subterfuge and uh, his actually. The, his two successors, uh, Yoshikira and uh, Yoshimitsu, uh, Yoshimitsu is really famous. Uh, he's actually the guy after whom the character in the Tekken fighting game is named. Um, but he also the guy who caused uh, the Japanese Taj Mahal, which is called the, te- the Temple of the Golden Pavilion. That's supposed to be the most beautiful building in Japan um, to be to be constructed. Um, these guys were the exact opposite of your stereotypical. Um, Shogun. So, in, you know, Japan historically has been a very, very insular culture up until 1853 when Matthew Perry arrived. Um, it was a very, very insular culture. They didn't like to have too many dealings with the outside world. And what dealings they did have with the outside world, they liked to keep very close control on those. This could possibly be as a result of the Mongol invasions in the sort of 13th century. So, 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 but just briefly during this period, Yoshi, Yoshi um, and uh, his son Yoshimitsu, the early Ashikaga period, they they opened Japan up to the world. They they wanted to um, start trade with China in a big way, um, and there was enormous economic boom. Uh, all these massive junks going back and forwards from China to Japan, carrying silks and and porcelain and all sorts of weapons, all sorts of things. They had a very, very friendly, unusually, that incredibly friendly relationship with the um, the Japanese, uh, the, sorry, the Chinese emperor Hong Wu um, at the time, uh, to to the extent that Hong Wu um, actually recognized uh, Yoshimitsu as the king of Japan. Uh, so that basically makes 
Yoshimitsu, the one and only king that Japan ever had, because obviously Japan's had emperors and Japan's had shoguns, but it only ever had one king. Um, and he was appointed by uh, Hongwu as the king of Japan. And and so there was enormous exchange of trade and secret societies were running this sort of thing. And those secret and societies wealth increased. were based on... <laughs> Yeah, but those secret societies were all based on these sort of shamanistic secret societies that you get in China and, and the, that got infused into Japanese society. And this idea that you could preserve shamanism inside secret societies, as well as in branches of religion that are more exoteric leaning, um, was infused into, into Jap- Japanese society at this, at this point in time. So, so effectively what happened was, anyway, this, this trade, went on and then it was quite interesting because there was a boom in trade there was also this enormous one of the world's biggest ever booms in piracy and you got the uh the biggest the world's biggest ever pirate fleets with you know like 300 ships and a pirate fleet this wasn't like one little ship coming over the horizon <laughs> flying the jolly roger Some like skull and ships in here, you know <laughs> and I, I believe they ran an entire province in in china the pirates for about 100 years you know so very very um very very uh uh powerful um, results to this this whole thing and sometimes i've described as um if anyone's familiar with the the uk tc tv series only fools and horses uh, i've described uh yoshi akira and and yoshimitsu as a sort of del boy and rodney of the show you know they, they they got some lamps in the back of the van would you like to buy them kind of thing <laughs> but on a much on a much grander scale they're, they're not your stereotypical idea of shoguns, obviously that their, their ancestor Takeuchi had been a, a a more stereotypical shogun, um, and so um, and so they they the Yoshida became very powerful, and then Kanatomo uh, became very influential. He he established a thing called the Daigengu at the the Yoshida Shrine in in um, in Kyoto. Um, which is, it's a beautiful place. Um, I, I spent many happy hours there. Um, it, it's almost magical that the way that the, it, it's part of a mountain. Mm. Um, and, and the way that it, it, that the whole thing blends into nature, it, it's obviously what's been trying to be portrayed is that, you know, human beings are not separate from nature. It's very, very shamanistic. Uh, but the thing that was unique about the Daigengu was that it, it had eight sides. It, it faced off to the eight directions, which is unheard of in a, in a Japanese shrine. Um, most Japanese shrines are like square, you know, oblong, uh, rectangular. Mm. Um, and this, what he was trying to portray was that, you know, that the, the kami, the, the, the spirits that are inside the shrine are the same as, not different from the, the spirit that extends throughout the universe. So you get, and, and in the architecture, the unique architecture that he created, um, and that Yoshida Shinto created, it, it it sort of tries to use architecture to teach shamanism. These eight, uh, these eight points. Well, just it's the eight directions. It just means yeah. in all directions, yeah. Uh, because you know, by that time, a lot of this idea was, oh, the spirit was inside the shrine. You know, um, I guess you you talk talk like the Ark of the Covenant. You know, when when people were carrying the Ark of the Covenant around, anybody gave them any hassle, they just zapped them with it. You know, yeah. um, it. it that kind of idea of the, or the, 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 the spirits inside the box sort of thing. He was trying to show, you know, this is just exotericism. This is just you believing stuff. Um, it, it really isn't like that. And, and, and today in a lot of these, these things that have descended from the Yoshida and, and were, were came under the Yoshida ended up having very broad skirts. I guess you'd say like the Catholic church had in the West and everybody just about came, or a lot of people came under their banner, including the organizations that were initiated by a lot of these sort of late 19th century shamans mm. um, came under their skirts. And, and if you go to a typical shrine uh, of one of these things, uh, or a typical Shinto shrine in Japan today, and you look at the actual shrine itself, the little shrine that sits on a big, a big usually on a big table or something, uh, there's usually a mirror in front of the shrine, a concave mirror. And what that's saying is, although you're sort of uh, clapping and they, they do like a double clap in Shinto and then they bow to the shrine, but what you're actually bowing to is what's reflected in the concave mirror, which is the whole of nature. So you can see the very, very shamanistic ideas being incorporated consciously because this this kind of thing doesn't happen often. Shamans aren't usually interested in that kind of stuff, you know. De- desperately trying to keep these teachings somehow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but Yoshida Kanatombo, because he operated on such a grand scale, he had to, you know, take into account things like architecture, you know. Mm. Um, 
And and so what happened was uh, the the Ashkaga family eventually um, fell into decline. Um, you can see how far they fell into decline. The the fifteenth. The 15th um, Ashkaga Shogun, 15th and last guy called Yoshiaki, he, was, um, he wasn't even killed by the, the, the warlord who came along to depose him. You know, a guy called Uda Nabanaga who, who met a sticky end himself in the end. But he just told him to sling his hook, basically. <laughs> so, you know, can you imagine for a military leader, you know, it's quite, quite shameful to don't push off, you know. Yeah. Uh, so they, they really weren't very... Um, they really weren't very um, powerful by the end of this period. There's 15 generations after Takeuchi set the whole thing up, you know, so obviously they lasted quite a long time. They lasted from, you know, um, the, the 1330s through to the 1570s, you know, so it's it's a long period of time. Um, but obviously with the decline of the Ashikaga, there's a sort of power vacuum there and the Yoshida became even more powerful. And they became very, very powerful and became very influential in Japan right up until the um, right up until the major restoration when the, the period started to decline. So winding all the way back to the original question, why did the shamness Nakayama Miki frown upon her son Shuji uh, founding this thing called Tenri no Kosho in the 1880s? Um, the answer is that she knew, well, actually it was before the 1880s, um, she she knew that the Yoshida's days were numbered. She knew that the, the events that were occurring in Japan at that time would inevitably lead to a change in the power structure. Mm. Um, and therefore, there was absolutely no point in going and seeking help from people who weren't going to be around for very long. Yeah. And I believe it was actually a couple of, just a couple of years before the, the actual Meiji restoration, um, that, that this thing, that should you kick this thing off originally? Yeah. And then it developed. So, so ironically, you know, that the, the, ironically, so Terminal Kosher then sp- later split into a bunch of different things, a bunch of different, um, Religious groups that then started to become exotericized. You know, they, they, they stand, Nakia and Miki uh, started off as an extremely shamanistic shaman, about as shamanistic as it's possible to get. Um, but then the groups very rapidly split into groups that became very quickly uh, exoteric in nature, uh, super fast. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so she, she died in 1887 and it took only to about 1910 for the biggest group to become heavily exotericized. Uh, that's a group called Temnikyo. Uh, but there were many, many other groups that, that split off. There was another really large group, um, uh, that split off from a student of hers, a guy called Onishi Aijiro, who was also a very, very shamanistic kind of guy. He was very, he was almost you know, like a shaman. Mm. And, and that was a one called Honmichi, which means like the natural path, Honmichi, the natural path. So again, he's trying to teach people shamanism. But then his group became exotericized really fast. But what's very interesting is, you know, one time we talked about, could Christianity, for instance, have been shamanistic, very shamanistic in its very early days? Um, and, you know, we said that's possible. There's no way of knowing one way or the other. Mm. Um, but if you look at what happened with these shamanistic groups in Japan, it took 20 years maximum for them to become <laughs> ridiculously exoteric from a very, very shamanistic starting point. This stuff can happen very, very quickly because you've had hundreds and hundreds of years of people being indoctrinated and brainwashed with exotericism. Yeah. And inevitably, they want to know where they sit within these quote unquote organizations. Yes. Uh, you know, there are a, a spectrum, you know. So if you, you know, there's probably more than a hundred groups that are split off from, for instance, that particular Shamna. She's probably, probably the most famous of them. But like I said, there were many others, uh, Bunjiro Kawate and others. Um, uh, many, many groups are split off from that. And, but the, you know, some of whom are more shamanistic and some of whom are less shamanistic. But it's almost a universal rule that the ones that are less shamanistic are bigger and the ones that are more shamanistic are smaller. Mm. Um, but then in recent years in Japan, we're talking about very, very recent years, pretty much all religions, um, have gone into decline. Um, as, as, you know, the, the, um, the general worldwide trend against religion, away from religion, um, uh, continues. Um, 
people are, have much broader education than they used to have in the old days. And also they view, they view religion, they've been trained to view religion in a ex, very exoteric way. And when you're very well educated and very broadly educated and you view religion in an exoteric way, it's very, very easy to start pulling holes in it. You know, it's, yeah. that can't possibly be true. You know, it's just nonsense, you know? Um, and, and so that they are going into decline uh, as is all religion um, in Japan at the moment. Um, and is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? Well, you know, from point of view of, of somebody who's not particularly a fan of exotericism, you say maybe that's a good thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, what's it being replaced with? You know, that's the question. You know, if it's, if it's being replaced with something equally exoteric, then, then it's no better than what went before, you know? So, so basically the, the upshot was that there was a long period of development of of shamanism into Shinto, and then a, a later two later big resurgences of the shamanism. The first one in the sort of uh, late fifteenth century, early sixteenth century, with Yoshida Kanetomo and his attempt to return to the original Shinto, which is you know, shamanism, um, and then. At the after the Meiji Restoration, there's a lot of upheaval, and then people, these these individual shamans all, all over Japan gathered followings. So what you can see from this is that shamanism people start to revert to shamanism when instability is introduced into society, and when society starts fragmenting, and that makes perfect sense because shamanism is very very good at running small groups of people. It's very, yeah. very good mechanism for that. And when society starts to fragment and it doesn't have a great, it doesn't have a great political unity. Remember, I'm not saying unity because in my opinion, political unity and social unity are two totally different things. But when it doesn't have political unity, people tend to be broken up into smaller groups. And then it's natural that some of those people would find opportunities to revert to shamanism to pick up a following. And so the, the kind of main place that shamanism exists in Japan today, there are two main places. One is this kind of a, um, various types of sh- very, very local, uh, out in parts of Japan that are not very, uh, not very urbanized, very, very local individual shrines that still run that old school kind of a way. Um, although even in, in modern Japan, there are various rules and regulations about how you become a Shinto priest and what you've got to study and stuff. So it's still, you know, even modern Japanese society still imposes the miasma on Shinto, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, and that was even stronger during the state Shinto period, that, that effect. And uh, so that's one place. And the, 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 the famous shrine maidens, the Miko, uh, who are like uh, divinators, uh, the word to start off with, but a lot of them, you know, that they're no more shamanistic than you would say choir boys are in a Christian church, you know. Mm. Um, they, they've just become part of the ritual, the exoteric ritual um, that's that's been absorbed into them from the West and from, and from Western religion and from Buddhism and, you know, from all this kind of stuff. Um, but some in some little places, you will find Miku who still practice proper shamanism to a certain extent. And there are thousands and thousands in Japan. To give you an idea of the scale, there are thousands and thousands of shrines in Japan, and probably in less than a hundred of them, you may find a real miko. Yeah, mm. I'll give you an idea of the proportions. Yeah, um, there are also very various branches of Shinto that are more or less shamanistic. We talked about Inari, the goddess Inari, and and the the uh, the type of shamanism that's associated with her. We talked about fox keeping and and using foxes as as a kind of spirit animal. There's a long tradition of that in Japan that still ex- survives to a greater or less extent in different regions. Uh, there are various regional people who act as sort of divinate as stroke shamans. There are some people who would literally look at them and say, in Japan, that's a shaman, but you won't find them in the middle of Tokyo, you know. Yeah. Um, and but but the biggest place where this stuff ju- survives today in Japan is in the various branches of the Shinshu Kyo, the new religions. Um, and but even there, you have to look at it with an educated eye. You have to investigate, and as I've done, you have to investigate and and practice that stuff with an educated eye. You will find shed loads of, um, you will find shed loads of shamanistic technique. In in those new religions, disguised you, as other things, 
it's not even disguised as other things. It's just dumbed down to the point where it's um, it's not as it was. So what I would say is, for instance, some of the exercises, um, some of the Amsco exercises, they might involve physical motions. They might involve breathing. When Amsco usually involves breathing in some way, but they will do those motions. But it's just like a dance. You know, mm. it's it's not the, the original shamanistic content is gone and it's just become a dance around most of the people. But then even if you take one of these groups, you know, just one of these groups. So let's take, for instance, Bunjiro Kawate's group, Konkokyo. Uh, you take one of those groups, there will be a spectrum of people within that group. And within that group, there will be some very exoteric people. One of the things we haven't mentioned yet is the the strong influence of Western evangelicals on these groups as well, you know. So they yeah. wanted, once once some of the, the, they became power structures, they became organizations, they wanted to spread their teachings, in inverted commas, among more and more people. Well, who were the best people at doing that, you know, so that the European and, and American evangelicals came in and basically taught them how to do that, uh, while simultaneously hoping to convert them over to their way of thinking and a lot of them did convert over to their way of thinking and that's another big subject we've skipped is the esoteric christianity in japan maybe we'll come back to that at a later date that's a big subject yeah because <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, christianity has been in japan for a very long time um but anyway and 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 had to go underground and become esoteric um but you know that that's that's a whole podcast in itself so so, but for instance, within Konkokyo, you would have some people who are very, most of the people, you would say, are very, very exoteric. They believe stuff. They go around believing stuff. But in among them, you'll find a not very vocal bunch who are still practicing exo- esoteric, shamanistic type of technique and practices. Mm-hmm. But they're not conspicuous because they will annoy their fellow parishioners, if you like, if, yeah. they, if they're conspicuous about it. So you get this in all of these groups. So, you know, even with it, not, it's not just comparing one group with another. How shamanistic are they? It's within individual group. How shamanistic are certain people? You have to, as I've done, you have to seek out those people. And I presume you have, you've met and seeked out these people. Well, I... I we better be careful what we say, um, but but not just me. I, I'd say that you've probably met one of these people. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. Um, but obviously, being interested in esotericism um, within one of these groups gets frowned upon. Yeah, and you can see that um, in in the fact that I mean, for instance, you, uh, this is a bit humorous. You know, you get the the founder of one of these groups encouraging the people who are studying with them to practice certain techniques and then those self same techniques being banned by the the later leadership of that organization uh do you follow yeah. what I mean? <laughs> that is descended from this person who they hold to be their founder yeah it's like oh i found it didn't know what they were talking about <laughs> you can't do don't do that thing that they told you to do. <laughs> uh, it's just mad. Uh, it's it? quite funny. It's quite funny. Yeah, but they are tremendous. If you and if you approach them in a ver- and and one, another issue is translation with these groups. So obviously they've adopted when they use their translation, they, they've adopted translation styles of the Western evangelicals. So what you see as a Westerner, if you first approach them in a superficial way, what you see is all that stuff, and you've seen it before. You've seen it from you know. Western evangelicals coming around and knocking on your door and saying these kind of things. You'll see the same kind of stuff in their literature and in their presentations and in the way that they talk to you. Um, but if you dig deeper, you'll find that there is a chasm mm. uh, between what's underneath all that. But you definitely have to dig it up, um, dig up the root of what's going on there, which is interestingly, unfortunately, what Nakayama Miki encouraged her, the people, her students to do was dig up the root of what she was teaching, not to take it at face value. Um, and thankfully that was enshrined. And this is why her particular tra- tradition is a, is a particularly good one. If you want to understand Japanese shamanism as well, if you want to understand shamanism, it's a particularly good one. And I would say that for, for me personally, I've learned so much from the tradition of Nakayama Miki. Um, just, I didn't learn it in the way that if you approach somebody from that transition, they'll, they will, um, they will bill it to you. That's you, probably the best way to put it. You read between the lines. Uh, yeah, deeply. Oh, and with assistance, you know, you know, I, you know, I'm fortunate to, to have as my teacher a uh, 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 great and uh, teachers plural uh, some great and, and very very experienced people and I, I feel so blessed to have had them mm. um, and without that you know no matter how much between the line reading 
um, that I was doing. Um, but you've also got to remember, it's not between the lines of a book, it's between the lines of activities. Yeah, it's between the lines of what's physically happening um, and what's what's happening um, in terms of people's interactions. And this whole thing with the book, you've got, always got to remember that because it's all about books these days, but that came from the West. That came from Western exotericism. Yeah. So again, you know, what do we do as Westerners? You know, we want to know about something. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the tradition of Nakema Miki, same, similar tradition, only Shinajiro. When there's, we go and buy a book, don't we? And we start reading about it. We want to know about shamanism. We buy a book on shamanism, you know? Yeah. And I think you asked me about that. What are my recommended to books, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, well, my real recommendation is that that's not how you learn shamanism. Yeah. Don't go and buy a book if you want to learn it. If you want to learn about it, then sure, buy a book. You know, uh, Mercy Eliade's book is is probably the, the the all you ever need to all you'll ever need to read if you want to learn about shamanism. Yeah. Well, another one uh, to mention if, is uh, if we particularly for this podcast about Japanese shamanism is the Catalpa Bow. Surely, that's quite a uh, good Carmen Blacker. Yeah, 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 Carmen Blacker's book that's specifically um, about Japanese shamanism. Yeah, but. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a good book. It's a good book. Uh, I wouldn't say any but. It's a good book. Um, it, it's, I, and I love that book. Um, it comes from a very Western point of view. That, that's yeah. all. So that, that's the caveat I would put on it. <coughs> uh, possibly, possibly less so than Eliade's book does. Um, uh, but, but, you know, thorough research, Carmen Black, oh my goodness, you know, there was a thorough researcher, you know. Mm. Um, uh, a great book, yeah. Um, no, no much more to say than that. All, all I would say is that another thing is she, she tends to focus on these, the, the sort of remnants of what's left in Japan. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I was reading it and every time she would be like, oh, and this is, uh, this is remnants of this technique, but it's gone now. And then I'd read yeah, another one. This and, is a remnant of it. Oh, but it's gone now yeah, every yeah. time. And, and as I said, she doesn't, in my opinion, she doesn't focus enough on the Shinshuku. Maybe she didn't have very good access. Uh, I mean, few people do have very good access to real deep access to the Shinshuku. Mm. Um, or what's behind them. You know, I was, I was fortunate. I sometimes you make your own luck in life, but you know, I, I was fortunate to run into somebody who's, who's gone deep, mm. you know. Who's gone deep? But maybe you know, 90, I could have run into ninety nine out of a hundred other members of the same group and got nowhere. So yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, we're about approaching time. I mean, I did want to talk to you a little bit about your direct experience uh, with Mongolian and Japanese shamanism and the differences that you've experienced or the commonalities you've experienced. But I think we can save that to next time. Um, yeah, well, sure. But I, briefly, I can say that there aren't many differences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said that before. Yeah. Uh, and the, the differences that there are is superficial. Yeah, they're superficial. And, and the more... I understand the more the more I become part of shamanism as I go through my life, uh, the l more superficial the differences appear to me. They, they, yeah. A lot of people like to talk about them, but to me, that they, they to this point in my life, they've become verging on irrelevances. Well, I liked what um, you. But I know that they are they are interesting to people. So maybe we can give a little bit of little bit of a super, superficial differences between Mongolian and Japanese shamanism. So we'll kick off with that and then we'll do a, a Japanese Amsko exercise. Yeah, yeah. I liked what you were talking about earlier when you were talking about um, the commonalities and you mentioned that it's it's hunter-gatherer shamanism and there's a difference between hunter-gatherer shamanism and, and what you might call esoteric shamanism or the more what yeah, shamanism I mean the, turned into. But the, but the difference... The difference is one of purpose. Yeah. Mm. Uh, hunter gatherer shamanism is essential. If you're hunter gatherer and you haven't got shamanism, you're not going to live no, very long. You're dead. <laughs> yeah, you, you need it. Yeah. If you're, um, a member of a settled civilized society and you haven't got shamanism, you could survive. Your life will be dull, but you could survive. Yeah. yeah. So that there's a major difference between the two. But, but esotericism in, in the sense that I, understand the word, which is the survival of shamanistic uh, practices into civilized society, um, 
it's shamanism. It's just a, a form of shamanism. You could call it degenerate if you want. You could call it less essential. But ultimately, deep down, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, there's probably a bit less of it, um, you know, that compared to proper full, full-blown shamanism. But, you know, but it certainly has value, you know. And I think one of the biggest values it has is just living life and just surviving in life. There's, there's more to life than that. You know, we talked about that, uh, that quote about Nietzsche, you know, pictures of cute animals remind uh, uh, me- make us think that nature's beautiful. It was something like that. And then it went on and said, but out there in real nature, it's all a, a story of doggy dog, you know. Death, disease, uh, and death destruction. Death, destruction, <laughs> that was it, yeah. And, um, and you know, and, and I said, well, if that's the case, why are hunter-gatherers always smiling? <laughs> you know? And why aren't people in civil civilised societies always smiling? We do have big problems with depression in our society that they don't have. We have a lot of problems with uh, mental health, lots of different mental health issues that they don't have. Um, uh, we certainly have a, a, a poor level of physical fitness compared to what they have. And you could say that we do have some great things that they don't have. We have, we have a very, very sophisticated medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have, um, you know, we have computers and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so... So fair enough, you know, but but why do you have to choose between the two? That's the satire question. Why not just have both, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what this podcast is all about. It's trying to reconnect us with that lost part, isn't it? That lost part of sure. ourselves. Right. Well, is, if there's if there's nothing else you want to uh, go into now, then I think we'd better wrap this up. So, okay, mate. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Damon, and uh, we'll continue this on the next episode with Japanese shamanism and maybe go into the. Uh, Fourth, is it? Amska technique? Might be the fourth Amska technique next uh, yeah. next episode. Fantastic. Um check out the website guys, uh, www.wovenenergy.com. Um there you can grab yourself a get started episode, uh, which is exclusive to the uh, email list, so get yourself signed up. Till next time, thanks so much. Keep practicing and we'll see you soon.